Thank you very much. My name is uh, Mohamed Hafid. I'm CEO of Introspect Technology, which is a private company based out of Montreal in, in Canada. So when I was asked to uh, speak at this panel about the next big innovation and test, I thought I would take a step back and you know look back at our history as as an industry in the semiconductor industry and and hopefully take some lessons from that and try to extrapolate into the future. So I started thinking about uh, some of the topics, you know, the most salient topics in our industry in the test and measurement world. And the um, first item that uh, comes to my mind is the uh, automatic test equipment, the ATE, those tools that we all love to use and to uh, uh, deploy production test solutions for, for our components. So um, a while back, in the early 90s, I'd say, and, and beyond, uh, we like to build our testers based on simulation models. In other words, the ATE had to behave exactly like our logic simulator. It had to do everything that our simulators could do, but in hardware. And so uh, you wanted to create edges and create cycles and so on. And so what this did was it created almost a rat race in the ATE industry where uh, the vendors were uh, creating more and more timing cycles, more and more edges, more accurate edges, all in this quest of creating a simulation-based tester. In my mind, this went on for too long. It may have been appropriate for a certain duration of our history as an industry. Uh, however, I believe that it went on for uh, a bit too long. And one of the reasons that it went on for too long is that something else was going on in the industry which is the notion that not all passing chips are essentially equal. You know, you had the notion of process variation and the notion that an absolute pass-fail threshold for semiconductor components was no longer valid. So this graph here is a, um, you know, is an example of this where, uh, you know, IDDQ used to be a measure for quality of chips. And what this graph is saying that basically uh, you need to center your pass-fail threshold based on your distribution and not based on some absolute constant value that uh, that you derive. And so the point I'm trying to make here is that more and more it started, to, uh, we started to enter a phase where uh, we're talking about what we do with the testers and not so much the testers themselves. It's, it's how we measure, how we analyze the results of tests that mattered the most and not the tester itself. And so we go on even further and, and uh, look at uh, wafer maps, right? And I make a statement here that basically really our jobs as test engineers became to become process engineers. W our mission is to learn how our yield var varies over time, right? So again, more on what we do with the data, what we do with the measurements that we collect on these chips, on these millions of chips that we produce, and less and less and less about the ATE itself and the tester itself. So more of, of basically having to worry about um, yield and how fast we can ramp on that yield curve to meet our time to my market mm -hmm. limits. So this basically takes us to the present day. And for the present day, I thought I'd you know, take a look uh, and highlight two items that I see today in our industry. One of them is the uh, fact that we're building chips and systems on chips based on IP now. Um, if you're not able to uh, to extrapolate what this means to test, uh, we can talk about it in the open session. But certainly this has uh, tremendous ramifications for our industry t when it comes to production testing of, of semiconductor components. The other item that I will describe, though, is what I call collaborative yield learning. So this is a fancy word, but really what it's saying is that if you had a product development schedule that looked like this, where the blue bar here maybe may have been design development and then you get into test chip phases and characterization validation and, and, and test program development and production and so on. If this used to be your schedule 20 years ago or even 10 years ago, uh, what is happening today is that your schedule looks more like this. You're really shipping parts out of the bench. You're shipping parts before you even know how they behave. This, this is true. You know, we, we all do it. You do it. We do it. This is a fact of the industry, and it's, it's what's allowing us to create the, the volume ramps that we see out of consumer electronics and out of other um, yeah, silicon-based uh, electronics. And so when I look at this picture, what I see is basically a, both a challenge and an opportunity. So the, the challenge is this, uh, you know, product development paradigm is, is very difficult, is very high risk, and uh, is very difficult to maintain or sustain. Uh, unless we are able to create what what I describe here as basically multidisciplinary ways of 
of you know crossing the boundaries between the horizontal bars on this on this, on this graph. So basically, in terms of instead of looking at uh, horizontal schedules that span from left to right, what I uh, uh, describe here is the notion that we have to cross on the horizontal axis of this graph and really create multidisciplinary tools that allow us to span all these uh, uh, sections so that we could, uh, you know, jump from the design phase to the production phase to the characterization phase and be able to ship products as soon as possible. So I call this multidisciplinary introspection. Uh, I called my company Introspect, and to introspect is to self-measure and, and self-assess. And what I really had in mind was this picture here, is that, that is, this is corporate-wide introspection, corporate-wide self-measurement. How do we compress the schedules without uh, aggravating the risk situation even further? So basically, this is what I have for the future, is we're going to see a new class of multidisciplinary tool uh, that basically borrows the best of each of the tools that we use in our you know, conventional development paradigms, right? So it, follows, it borrows from EDA uh, tools in terms of scripting. It borrows uh, from software style uh, development where you're uh, talking regression and versioning and so on. It has uh, bench-like accuracy, but at the same time, it's very rapid in data collection the way we have built our ATE. And then last but not least, at the very bottom right corner here is that these tools will be very, very portable and will be extremely cheap because the vision we're seeing here is that we are going to deploy these tools uh, at a whole lot of locations. A lot of engineers, different kinds of engineers, software engineers, firmware engineers, hardware engineers, developers, uh, characterization engineers, test engineers will all be carrying around tools like this that would allow for cross-function, cross-department um, testing and, and verification. So there you have it. I usually end with a analogy, and, and this is the analogy that I have today. Just like the computer has, uh, you know, evolved and, and created the smartphone, which is a new kind of computer, a new kind of computer that is a lot more available, that allows you to do computing and web access anywhere in the world. Uh, we're seeing in the test and measurement world the emergence of portable um, introspection tools that basically uh, create a new category of, of test tools for all kinds of development engineers and all kinds of product engineers. Thank you.